I would love to just open up a passage with you all and to talk about Jesus this morning. I didn't start my watch, but we're starting fresh. So 55 minutes from here, baby. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> oh, that's cool. You guys have fancy graphics. That's awesome. Okay. Um, <laughs> I feel so loved and seen by that. Um, I made a promise to you all, I think two years ago, none of you remember it, I can guarantee you that, um, but I promised you that every time I came here and would open up the Bible with you, I would do two things. Um, one is that I, I said I would always only preach or teach, however you want to think of it, um, from a gospel story, uh, something that Jesus did while he was here. That's where my heart is. I don't know why. I just love looking at these stories, things that he did while he was here in flesh. And then the other thing was, I, I said um, that I would never teach, and I kind of regret saying this now, uh, that I would never teach from a passage um, that I hadn't committed to memory. And so on the first Sunday I did that, it was like two years ago, I picked like a really short passage, and it was like really easy. Um, and this one's longer, and so we're here. And that came from a conversation I had with my Young Life leader, Jeff. Um, he had about a month to live, and we're sitting in a hot tub at the beach, drinking a cold beverage, milk, and he said, he said, you know what's interesting is um, it seems like the older we get, the less we spend time committing God's word to memory. Why is that? Like when we're kids, we have all these memory verses, you know, like that's part of, you know, Sunday school. And he's like, and we just kind of lose that a little bit, right? And if we do, then we tend to memorize these like Christian living verses, truths about the gospel, truths about Jesus that are good to remember, Okay. Um, for I've been crucified with Christ. Cast all your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. Verses like this. For I'm, uh, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. We memorize these verses. And he said, how come no one memorizes gospel accounts, stories about Jesus? That's how they're written down in the first place, oral tradition, remembering things word for word. And uh, when he passed away, you know, when we had that conversation, I didn't think much of it. I just thought, yeah, Jeff, that's kind of cool. Um, but when he passed away, I, I just, um, I was reminded of it uh, as I went to the beach the following year and was nearby, I was reminded of that conversation, and so I've been doing this now for a number of years, and I love it, and so um, we're going to start this morning with a test. I'm not going to look, hopefully it's, is it going to be on the, I hope it's not on the back screen, that'll be too tempting, <laughs> but this is, um, this is John 21, um, 1 through 14 in the ESV. I, I chose that because I feel like this is kind of an ESV church, am I wrong? Okay, okay, ESV, cool. Um, oh, it is back there, ah, oh, ah, oh. after, after this, no, I'm just kidding. I just won't look. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples. I hate that it's up there because then you, then you just see every word. I think it's word for word, okay? Okay, good. Now I can cheat a little bit. And those of you that have ESV, I would love uh, for you to like, I don't know, let me know how I did afterwards. After this, Jesus again revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. <laughs> he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. When they, for they were not, ooh, almost messed up. For they were not far from land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, the land or land? I don't remember. Okay, dang it. Thought I had it. When they got out on land, we'll say, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. 
Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples, is that right? (laughs) Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. So Jesus came and gave them the bread. And so with the fish. This is hard. (laughs) Now, this was the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. How did I do? Was that decent? Nailed it. Okay, don't clap, don't clap. Makes it weird if you clap. Um, <clears throat> before I pray, I want to say um, something about that. Um, if, and, and this feels weird because like I just did that, and now it's going to seem like um, holier than thou, and I'm like standing higher than you guys. But um, if, if we really believe that this is the inerrant word of God, living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Um, why don't we just, why don't, can we just treat it like that a little bit more, maybe, in our lives? Could we min- spend more time in it, and, and could we commit it to memory? Could you, uh, this week, choose a passage to memorize? And go to your spouse or your best friend and throw them the Bible and say, I just memorized this, I need you to, need you to check it for me. Here we go. And then the other thing is this, and this is kind of a young life thing, but I think that as believers, we're called to this too. There's another thing that I think that we should commit to memory, and it's people's names. I think, I think that Christians should be the best name rememberers ever. When you meet that person on the street, and it seems like just a whatever interaction, and you think you're never going to see them again, I hope that you're walking away saying their name back to yourself and praying for them, that you say their name in conversation, that the next time you see them, because you will, and you say their name, you'll see the look on their face when they're shocked and they, they don't remember your name. <laughs> it's the easiest, most simple, quick way to show someone that you care. Because you wouldn't remember the name if you didn't. Remember people's names. And a lot of you are like, that's just hard. I'm not, an, I'm not good at that. I'm not good at that. It takes work. Joy tells me two things to get from the grocery store. And I go to the grocery store and I forget both of them. And I have to text her and be like, what was it? It takes work, but I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it to memorize God's word, to memorize people's names. So let's work at that, okay? <laughs> I'm going to pray and then stop being so preachy. God, would you help us this morning to understand um, not just this passage better, but to get a clearer picture of who you are, that we would leave this room understanding your love for us um, maybe just a little bit better this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, every time I get to a passage and I'm supposed to be teaching from it or even just like reading it on my own, um, I always go uh, back a little bit and figure out like where is this in the context of everything, you know, and especially a passage like this that starts with after this, well, after what? Um, so here's where this passage is. We're now post-resurrection, um, and in preparing for this morning, I had a ton of fun just um, researching and reading about all the events of af- what, ha- what took place after the resurrection. Who did Jesus appear to, and what did those days look like? For example, I didn't know that it was around 40 days that he did this. Like, I thought it was like a, you know, like a one-week period, you know? Um, and so I, I, I loved looking at this, and I'm going to kind of um, unpack that a little bit. But first, it's important to note that this is the second miraculous catch. I think a lot of you know that. This is the second time that Jesus has performed this miracle. The first time is back in Luke 5. Um, it's, not the, it's not the time that, that Simon Peter first meets Jesus, but it's around there. Um, Jesus had just actually uh, gone over to um, Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house and healed her. And uh, the next day, you know, Jesus is at the shore, at the, le- at the same Sea of Galilee, Sea of Tiberias, whatever you want to call it. And uh, he's teaching and ends up getting in the boat that belongs to Simon Peter. And he teaches from the boat. And then afterwards, he says, put out a little bit. Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Peter's like, listen, man, like, I'm a fisherman. You're, a, I think, a bricklayer or a carpenter or something. I know what I'm doing. We've been out all night. We've caught nothing. But sure, you know. And what does he do? He throws the net down, and there's this huge catch of fish, and a couple things happen in this, in this miracle that are important later, I think. Um, and one of them is uh, there's all these other boats that come around, and they're, they're, the net is breaking. There are so many fish. It's chaos. They start putting the fish in the boats, and the boats are sinking because there's so many fish. I'm a fisherman, and I read that, and I get excited. I'm like, that sounds 
awesome. You know, for a boat to be sinking full of fish, they would have had to be like waist deep in fish. Can you imagine that? The wriggling, how like it's spiny, the fish can get you, you know, like that would hurt. Um, and so there's, the boats are sinking, it's chaos. And what does Peter do? Peter essentially falls on his face and he realizes that there is something way different about Jesus. And he says, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. He's scared. He just saw a miracle and he knows it because everything he knows about fish was just blown away. He's like, depart from me for I'm a sinful man. Jesus says, I'd never caught this before, Jesus says to him, don't be afraid. He's like, hey, don't freak out. Don't be afraid. Then he says, you all know, from now on, you're going to be a fisher of men. So that's the backdrop to this. That was the first time that this miracle happened. I probably left some stuff out. We'll probably, I'll probably remember when I get to it here. You'll be a fisher of men. So we have this idea in our head. We can arrive. We're like, okay, we get it. It's a metaphor now. The fish are men. This is something about God's kingdom, the way that God is going to be bringing people into his kingdom, drawing people in, if you will. It wasn't like today's fishing, which is like with a a lure or a fly, if you're like me, and you like, you trick a fish into thinking that it's real, and then you go, ha, and you catch it, and you reel it in, and you're like, gotcha. It wasn't like that. It was like throwing out and bringing in, throwing this net out and bringing people in. So that's the backdrop. And then the, the, I mentioned the resurrection appearances. I had to write these down. I did not memorize these. But this is awesome, and this is like, you know, somewhat, not disputed, but like the order of events is kind of hard to figure out here. But here's the uh, order of appearances, kind of, or at least the good number of the appearances that Jesus appeared to people after he was resurrected. There's Mary Magdalene, right? Um, He says she thinks he's the gardener. I think she's looking down, maybe. Or he he was a little bit, I think, different looking or different appearing because she didn't recognize him. But when he says her name, Mary, she looks up and sees who he is and says, Rabbi. So he appears to her first. And then the other, the other women, uh, the other Mary, mother of James, um, and uh, Salome, he appears to them first, the women first. And then this one's really interesting that I didn't know about. In 1 Corinthians 15, and then uh, somewhere else, Jared knows, somewhere else, uh, there's, there's just these, these two mentions that Jesus appeared to Peter, or Cephas, first, before the other disciples. In 1 Corinthians 15, you know, Paul's going through this thing. He's like, you know the truth. Here's the truth, that he's resurrected from the dead. He first appeared to Peter and then the other disciples. And we don't have any account of that written down. We don't know what that time looked like. But can you imagine? We'll get to Peter in a second. But he appeared to Peter first, somehow. We don't know how. Then there's the road to Emmaus, disciples, the two guys walking along. Um, They eat with Jesus. In that moment, they realize when he breaks the bread, they're like, oh, wait a second. This is Jesus. Um, Then those guys come back. Uh, then there's when Jesus appears to the disciples without Thomas present, right? They're like, Thomas, you're never going to believe this. We, you just missed him. We were with Jesus. And he's like, yeah, right. I'll believe it when I see it, essentially, right? Then the very next appearance is eight days later. Jesus appears to them again, now with Thomas present, and says, here, touch. Here, it's me. And Thomas believes. Then there's this appearance. He appears to the seven disciples at the Sea of Galilee. So this is right after he's appeared to them and had the Thomas incident. Then there's a mountain in Galilee where the 11 disciples, and some say this is the 500 that's mentioned. There's a great commission given. Then there's another random appearance that I didn't know about in 1 Corinthians. Paul also mentions that Jesus appeared to James. He says he appeared to James and then the other disciples. So there's this James appearance, which we don't know anything about. And then the 11 disciples in Jerusalem. I think there's one more I might have missed in there. But here's where we are. He's just appeared to the disciples with Thomas present. And that's where we find the after this. It says after this. So I mentioned Peter. Now we arrive to the story. If you can just imagine what it's like to be one of Jesus' disciples, you've just watched this person that you've spent years with be executed in brutal fashion by the Romans. And you're like, and you know, they've seen him now resurrected from the dead, so I think the gears are starting to turn maybe. And they're like so slow at understanding (laughs) what is going on. You ever read this and think like, who could be so slow and so dumb? And it's like, oh, me, it's me. It's me, I'm the disciples. Um, They're beginning to understand maybe. But they're also just like, what, are we, what do we do next? 
what's the next step? What, you know, like Jesus appears to them, says some things, goes away. And so they return to what they did before. Remember the miraculous catch when Jesus calls them, they leave the nets. They leave everything. They leave the boats. They leave everything behind. They're like, that stuff, this is way, at, at, at least at the time, this is way cooler. <laughs> this is way more interesting to me than, than these nets, this fish, this life I was living. So leave it all behind. And I wonder if there's this moment where they like get to their little like hut by the, the Sea of Galilee and they're like dusting off their nets, like <laughs> getting them out, like, well, I guess we'll go fishing again. And Peter's like, I'm going fishing. And that's me. I, I'm the same way. If I have to think through something, if I'm dealing with something, other than sitting alone with my phone off and the Bible, fishing is the next best thing for me. To go to the mountains, to fish for brook trout, to just sit on a, a rock on the stream and just look at God's creation and to think and be silent. That's me. So I can relate to Peter here. He's like, I'm going fishing. Maybe, maybe if nothing else, the sensation of feeling that fish in that net will be enough to just lift my spirits a little bit. And of all the disciples, Peter needs it the most, right? Peter was always the most zealous, the most fiery. He was the first one to proclaim Christ as Christ. He jumps out of the boat and walks on water, one of only two people to ever do that. The other is the creator of the water. <laughs> and then Peter, a fisherman, walking on water. He lops off that dude's ear. <laughs> I don't remember his name. Jared does. And, it, <laughs> and uh, he, he says to Jesus, I will, essentially, I will die for you. And Jesus says, will you? Actually, I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you'll actually deny me three times. And Peter's like, no, never. Not me. But then he does. Three times. Then the, the crow, uh, the rooster crows, not the crow, that'd be weird. The rooster crows, and in Luke's account, it says that Jesus makes eye contact with Peter. That somehow, maybe through a window or across the courtyard, they make eye contact. And Peter realizes in that moment how sinful he really is. Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. I think it finally hit home in that moment. And he's like, I, I can't believe I did that. That's not me. So Peter's just um, hunched over. I'm going fishing. They're like, we'll go with you. We're a team. We got this. Let's go. So they hop in the boat. They, uh, they go fishing at night. Um, that has to do a little bit of, of how fish um, rise in the I won't go into that. But it's a little bit easier to catch them at night. They're higher in the water column. But also it's dark, so like, they're not going to see the nets as easily, right? That's kind of common sense. They fish at night. They fish all night. And they catch nothing. In fishing, that's called getting skunked. I don't know if you guys knew that. Um, but you say, like, when you come home from fishing and you catch nothing, you're like, well, I got skunked. Uh, or when you're fishing and you catch the first uh, fish, even if you're not in a boat, the thing you say is, well, at least we got the skunk out of the boat. Like, it's one of the first things you say. And the worst part about getting skunked is when you have to tell someone that you got skunked. <laughs> Later, we'll get to this. Jesus says, you have any fish? And they're like, no. That's why I read it that way. That's how I say it when, when I get home and Joy has given me these, these hours to go away and fish. And I come home and she's like, how was it? Did you catch anything? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I didn't. Okay. But it was awesome. Um, they are fishing all night and they catch nothing, which I think is, um, it could be emblematic of uh, returning to what they were before Christ. Maybe they were half decent at it, but without him, it's like, they're like, uh, they're, they got nothing, you know? So they fish all night. If you can imagine at dawn, Jesus standing there at the shore, the small waves lapping up by his feet, the sand under his feet, he looks out at them and sees their, their empty nets, their empty boat, and smiles. And he calls out to them. And he says, children, do you have any fish? And I think there's only one other place that he calls them children. It's all, earlier in John. John loves that word, the Greek word for child. He uses it all the time. And then this and then his epistles. He says, um, in, earlier in John 13, he says, children, uh, essentially where I'm going, you cannot go. He calls them children. And then here, he calls them children. And, and you know, I have a, a four-year-old, one kid, um, not a lot of kids, just one, but I'm, like, decent at understanding <laughs> parenthood a little bit. And uh, we're in this stage with Kinsley right now where um, we are constantly saying this one phrase over and over and over again. I don't know who came up with it. We just, like, always say it. We say, Kinsley, ooh, Kinsley, Kinsley. Listen and obey. 
Uh, she, I mean, you'll say something, and it's, but, 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 and we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. listen and obey. Uh, it is like everything we say is contested, you know, like, oh, well, no, no I, I don't do that. No, listen and obey. That's what it's like having a child. And here he's like, children, do you have any fish? And he's like setting them up. They're like, no. And he's like, all right, cast the net on the right side of the boat. And this is even more ridiculous than the first miracle, because the first miracle, he's like, hey, put out a little bit into deeper water. Okay, and that kind of makes sense. It's like, okay, yeah, he might be able to see or something like a pot of fish, and he's like, go towards them, cast there. But this is literally just a side of the boat. And if you can just think about it, it doesn't matter which side of the boat you cast the net off of. It's still the water underneath you. Like the net's going to fall there and go down, or it's going to fall there and go down. Listen and obey. Cast the net on the right side of the boat. And then I love that it just says, so they cast it. <laughs> I imagine they're like, all right. <laughs> and whatever, you know, like, let's see. And they didn't know that it was Jesus. Again, we don't know what he looked like, maybe, or if you're just far enough away, they weren't expecting it. Cast the net on the right side of the boat. So they cast it. And then they feel that weight that only a fisherman can understand, that tug. And they're like, hold on, what? And they go to pull this thing in, and they could barely haul it in. It says seven of them, seven men pulling this huge net full of wriggling, slimy fish into this boat. And it's John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. I love that he calls himself that. The disciple whom Jesus loves realizes in this moment, Peter, we've seen this before. He looks to the shore and he says, that's Jesus. This is my favorite part. Let me make sure I'm not moving too fast, though. Yeah. Peter pulls a Forrest Gump and just jumps off that boat. Who knows what I'm talking about? That's the best scene in the movie. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, watch it um, or ask your parents if you're allowed to. But <laughs> Forrest Gump, is, he sees Lieutenant Dan for the first time in forever. He stands there and does that. And then he just can't believe it. And then in his full clothes, just launches himself into the water and starts swimming. And there's that amazing scene where, you know, Lieutenant Dan says, uh, yeah, well, I figured I'd test out my sea legs. And Forrest Gump says, Lieutenant Dan, you ain't got no legs. Um, <laughs> and then the boat crashes into the shore behind him. And he goes, it's my boat. Um, I don't know why I went into all that. It's just a great scene. But that's this. Peter, in that moment, so John says, well, that's Jesus. And in that moment, Peter puts on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work. We don't know what that means. A lot of people make a lot of that statement. He was, he was, when you're working, you take off layers because it's hot, you know? We don't know what he was wearing, but he put on his outer garment and then jumps into the water in it. Crazy. But in that moment, nothing matters to Peter as much as being with Jesus. Can you imagine his thought cycle? He could have... John could have said, that's Jesus. And maybe me, if it was me, I'd be like, ooh, yeah, uh, let's go this way. <laughs> let's go the other way. Uh, I don't know if I'm ready to, for this interaction. But no, Peter force gumps into the water, poof, swims to the shore. In that moment, the fish meant nothing to him. Nothing mattered as much as just being with Jesus. And he swims to the shore. He gets out of the water. He's dripping wet. And then the other guys, it says, the other disciples come following him, dragging the net full of fish, which is funny. It's just that's thrown in there. It's like, there was still work to do. Peter got out of it. <laughs> like the guys are like, okay, okay, Peter. Like, we'll handle the fish. You go ahead. Yeah, sure. They drag this net. 100, 100 yards, it says. They're dragging this net. Because they couldn't put it in the boat, notice. It was too many fish. So they're dragging it in the water behind them. And they get to land, and they find a fire. I should have mentioned this before the, when I went past the Peter thing. Um, in the, I got too wrapped up in the Forrest Gump. Um, I just think that, like, that Peter leaping out of the boat, nothing else mattering to him in that moment but Jesus, that should be how we start every day. We should start every day of our lives like that. It should be as if Jesus is on the shore, we catch a glimpse of him, and we throw ourselves into the water, fully clothed, and swim to him. Because nothing else matters as much as him. That's a lot of fish. That's a lot of money. <laughs> and he threw himself away from it and swam to Jesus, which I think is awesome. They get there and they find this fire. Buckle up. 
we're going to talk about fire a little bit. I'm so excited. If there's anything that I love more than fishing, it might be fires. Not in a weird way. I just love to say, I'm not like going to start one here. I'm not going to light more candles. Um, I just, okay, here's, this is a, a will thing. This is not scripture, but just, I think it's um, worth doing. When's the last time you invited friends over for a, a campfire? Not, not a huge brush fire where like you have some brush you have to burn and you're like, we're going to light on fire. Come on over. And you light it up. A lot of people do that. That's fun. Very hot, huge fire. <laughs> Everyone has a story of like using too much diesel or something, and it's like, boom. Um, not one of those. Those are great. But uh, just a log fire that you can sit around together and have to inch towards to get warmer, that you can conversate over. When's the last time you did that? And, and if it's recently, that's awesome. I, I think you should do that this week. You know, like C.S. Lewis has that quote that says, is there any pleasure that's greater than a group of Christians, I'm butchering it, but a group of Christians sitting around a fire together? There's something um, that happens when you're sitting around a fire um, and talking about life that just doesn't happen elsewhere. So I would say, um, find some wood. You ca- call me if you need some wood. Come on over, 14306 Norman Road, and I will load you up with just great seasoned firewood that'll light up. Just, you could hold a log and just like put a match to it probably. And uh, I will facilitate this for you, but I want you to spend more time around fires because here's another reason, is there are a few things in Scripture— There are a few um, specific, particular human experiences that we know that Jesus experienced. We can assume a lot. He was human. He was fully human. So we can assume a lot. He ate. He did. He burped. You know, like these things, okay? But there's like these specific things every once in a while. And here's one that I think is really cool. That Jesus made a fire. That he had fish laid out on it. That he created this fire. And he sat around it with friends. So in some ways, to create a fire and invite friends into it, it's kind of (laughs) Christ-like. It's a way that we can experience life a little bit like he did, to create a fire and sit around it. You follow? Does that even make sense? I don't know. There are a couple other instances where we can see, like, okay, Jesus experienced this thing, and I think as believers, we should try as much as possible to experience life the way that he experienced it. And that might mean, like, hitting up a friend that was a, a brick mason and saying, hey, I'm going to come help you uh, lay bricks, because Jesus laid a lot of brick. It looks different now than it did, but to experience what that was like, I think that's cool. Kind of nerdy, but cool. Um, <laughs> so do that. Okay, so the fire. Uh, there's only uh, one other place in the whole New Testament that, uh, that this word, uh, anthrakia, for fire is used. And this is beautiful, and you've heard this probably, but the only other place it's used is that time that Peter denies Christ in the courtyard. This word for charcoal fire. And so he's sitting at this fire, and across the fire, that's small enough to talk over, someone says, wait a second, wait a second. You're one of them. You know Jesus. Yeah, 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 that's you. You know him. And Peter says, never heard of him. Me? No. Must be a guy that looks like me. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about, Ian. Around this fire. And I was thinking about this. As I came in from the fire, I, I try to have a fire like five times a week if I can. We have so much wood to burn. I'm serious. Come over. Get some from me. Um, and I was coming in from the fire, and I was just struck by how smelly you are coming in from one of those campfires, right? Um, that beanie that I wear, it's like my fire beanie, just like reeks all the time of fire. And if I want to not smell like a fire, I have to change clothes, okay? Like I have to put those clothes in the hamper. I have to change clothes. And I have to, like, I have to shower. It gets in your hair. It gets everywhere. Uh, and I have to wash those clothes. And all this stuff just to get rid of that smell. What I'm getting at is, think about Peter. Did he, did he go shower? Did he change clothes even between now and, and the crucifixion? Here's what I think. I think he denies Jesus at this fire. And then whether he was witnessing the crucifixion, we don't know. Or if he was somewhere that day when it was happening... I think he was there. There's reason to believe that he was there in the crowd. As he's watching the creator of the universe be executed, his friend that he has followed for years, that he still smells like fire, that he smells himself and is reminded of denying that he even knew Jesus, that this smell, he he begins to hate this smell As he's looking at at Jesus being executed, he's reminded of his sinfulness. Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. I think he gets it. 
that he smells like this fire. And I wonder if every time he saw a fire between then and this day, if he was reminded of that, if he had a hard time sitting around fires. I wonder if he tried to scrub that smell off. And here, Jesus, the only other time that that word charcoal fire is used is here on this morning. Peter swims up to the shore, and there's a fire made for him by the creator of the universe. Some people, you could say, like, he snapped his fingers and, like, a fire appeared, and the fish appeared on the, on the fire. But I think I know Jesus well enough to know that he made this fire meticulously. He took time to make this fire so that he could give Peter this awesome, redemptive moment around a fire to contrast it from the one that he had in the courtyard. That first fire in the courtyard was at night. Surrounded, Peter, surrounded by his enemies, fearing for his life. And look at this fire, the morning, the morning fog, surrounded by his closest friends, realizing that his friend, Jesus, is the savior of the world and has power over death because there he is in front of them. The contrast between the two is amazing to me. That Jesus thought this up. I'm going to make him a fire. And I'm going to invite him to sit with me around this fire. So he does. He creates this fire. The other disciples come dragging the fish. I mean, yeah, all the fish, the net in the fish. They get there on land, and Jesus says to them, first, bring some of the fish that you just caught. He's already, he already has some fish on the fire, but he wants them to bring some to the table too. And that's not a crazy illustration to understand. Jesus is saying, my plan A at this point is you, to bring people to me. He's saying, bring some of the fish that, that you just caught. I could do it on my own, but I want you involved. Bring them. And who goes? Peter. He's like, I'll do it. Still dripping wet. He's like, well, I figure, like, you know, they dragged it in, so I'll go over there. He goes over to the net, starts pulling the fish out. Uh, for those wondering, I, you know, had never really thought, what kind of fish are these in the Sea of Galilee at that time? There's three different kinds of fish they were. One is kind of like a tilapia type thing, and those are the most tasty. I think that that's what Jesus had on the fire for them. They're called a mushed fish. The other is called a briny or a briny fish, kind of like a, like a carp or like a catfish. And then there's like sardines. I don't think there were many sardines in this net because it says they're full of large fish. Peter goes to that net, pulls it apart, starts counting. <laughs> and he counts the fish. And this is like one of my favorite things in scripture is that we know how many fish were there that morning. And, and this is just one small way I think it's important is that this isn't just some epic of Gilgamesh type book or epic, you know, where there's like not a lot of detail. This is an account, an eyewitness account. And someone's saying, it wasn't just a lot of fish, it was 153 fish. It's one of the ways that we as believers can trust the scriptures. It's not just a lot. He says a lot other times, it's 153. We remember that. And a bunch of people, you know, as I read about that number, there's like some connection, but it's, it's all kind of like loose. I think it's just important that there's that many. And that one day, Jesus will welcome a specific number of people into his kingdom. That it's not just a lot of people or some people, it's individual people that he knows, each of them. He knows how many hairs are on their heads, each one of us and each one in the kingdom. He knows everything about everyone, and he has a select few that will be welcoming into the kingdom with him forever. Specific number, 153 of them. That's all I'll say about that. So they bring in the 153 fish, and it says, although there were so many, the net was not torn. John throws that in there. Because in the first miracle, the net is what? Breaking, fish are going everywhere, it's chaotic. And he's like, not so this time. No, no, it was the weirdest thing. That net didn't break. It's almost like that was a miracle in itself. That they'd seen these nets work before, and they'd never held that many fish before. They're like, what's up with that? And I just think it's important to note that that means, to me at least, that the gospel net is strong enough to hold even you, sinner. <laughs> That because of the cross and the resurrection that has now happened, Jesus is now post-resurrection appearing to them, and he's like, back then it was one way, but now, now it's a little bit different. Now the net will hold. I was the sacrifice. 
The sacrificial system is now done away with because I was the sacrifice on the cross. Do you see? And he's saying, the net is not going to break. The net will hold. And I think one thing that I think about with this when, I, when I'm in a church and thinking about um, salvation and, and who will be in heaven and who will not, I think ultimately one thing this makes me think about is that the net is larger and wider and stronger than we might think. And what I mean by that is that I think there's going to be people in heaven that you're shocked to see there. And I think there won't be people there, and you'll be shocked by that too. But I think that net is wide, and it is strong. For anyone who professes faith in Jesus Christ, anyone, look at the thief on the cross. The very last moment of his life has a somewhat profession of faith. And Jesus is like, you're coming with me today to paradise. The will translation there. I think the net is wider than we think it is. So then Jesus says to them, man, probably I say this a lot, but like this is probably number three of my list of favorite things Jesus has ever said. Come to breakfast, or here, come and have breakfast. Just think about this for a second. The ineffable, I'm going to take like 10 steps back to get us to this moment. The ineffable, unapproachable, omnipotent God who created the universe, who thought up mitochondria, who thought up how photosynthesis would work, who numbered out the the hairs on your head, decided to be born into this broken world as a baby. A crying, screaming, pooping baby. And lived a perfect life. Grew up through adolescence, lived a perfect life, and then willingly allowed himself to be executed in the most painful and gruesome way possible on a cross, could have saved himself at any second, is in a tomb dead for days, his lifeless body, as he experienced separation from God, as he became sin for us, And then he defeated death one morning when he breathed again and his eyes shot open. He comes out of the grave and starts appearing to people. And if this is me, then I have some stuff that I want to say to them. And I want to be like, look at me. I did it. Here's how sinful you are. Here's what you did wrong. Listen to me. I told you. But of the times that he appears, there's only a couple, 10, 11 maybe, Here he just simply says, bring some of the fish. Come and have breakfast with me. It's so simple. Will you just just come here? Will you sit with me at this fire? Close enough that you smell like it? Will you just come and be with me in this moment? And I think in 2021, here's what this looks like for us. Is that we wake up. And it's a Monday morning. And we slept a little late. We're late for work. We go down to the kitchen. We're pouring our coffee. And there's Jesus. Pardon the cheesiness. There's Jesus sitting at the table with breakfast ready for us. And he's watching us hurriedly get ready. And he's saying, come and sit with me. I made breakfast. And we're like, ooh, uh, yeah, I would, um, but, but I, I'm, I'm in a rush. I got to go. Uh, we will catch up later for sure. Okay, yep, count me in next time, and, and we're out the door. Or, ooh, yeah, no, I, I would love to, but I have important stuff to do, like arguing with people I don't even know on Facebook. And I would, I think I, I'm going to do that this morning before I, I'm going to let that be the start to my day. That's the best way to do it. He's just sitting there, and he's created this for you. And he's saying, will you come and experience this with me? Will you come and just be with me even? And we're like, yeah, maybe next time. I'll fit that into my schedule. We're not leaping out of the boat, really. We're just kind of like, we can maybe try a little bit. Maybe I'm speaking to myself, but that's how I feel. That he's there and he's saying, will you come and just be with me? All right, I'll close with this. Jesus is saying, 
come and have breakfast with me. And we are all like Peter. Maybe you haven't denied Christ word for word like Peter did and said, oh, I don't even know Jesus. What? No. But man, do we do it like, I don't know, 50 times a day with the way that we live our life? Actually, more than a thousand times a day. Do we deny Christ by the way we live our life, the way we spend our time, the way we spend our money, the way we talk about others? It's as if we're denying that he is who he says he is. We're forgetting who he is. We're just like, yep, no, I'm my own person. I'm more important. And we deny him. That's what sin is. And I'm asking you this morning, will you leap out of the boat fully clothed in all your sinfulness? Will you swim all that way to Jesus? Will you come onto the shore? Will you sit close enough to the fire that Jesus has made that you begin to smell like it? Will you smell like Jesus to other people? Will you believe that the net is strong enough to hold even you, you messy, messy sinner? And will you just listen and obey when you are with him to the simple commands that he lays out for us about how life works best? It might sound weird, like cast the net on the right side of the boat. But it's as simple as a father saying to his children, listen and obey. Cast the net on the right side of the boat. For us, C.H. Spurgeon says that the casting looks like this, that God, or we, we speak to all. God speaks to some. He is saying, you cast the net. I'll handle the fish. But you keep casting. Listen and and obey. Will you do those things? Can we do those things? I think we can and we should. Every day. I'm done talking. I'm going to pray and then uh, we're going to close. Father, I pray that you would reveal to us two things. One, um, how sinful we are. We reveal to us the way that we have denied you um, and that we continually deny who you are. And then simultaneously, will you reveal to us how much you love us regardless. And that would that love change our life forever? Will you send us out of this room as people that have been redeemed by a risen Savior who have sat with him around a fire that smell like him? Will you let us know you more? It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you all so much.